Hey, what's going on, champs? I'm Erin Deliosa. Welcome to an Immigrant's Life podcast, my podcast about immigrants and immigration and everything in between. Thank you for listening and downloading the show, and thank you for supporting my dad. Christmas came and Christmas went, and I hope it was a good one for you. I hope you had a chance to spend it with your family and loved ones, maybe physically or electronically, but now we're on to the new year. Speaking of new year, have you written down your new year's resolution? I haven't. Unfortunately, I've been inundated with different things, but I'll get to it soon. However, if you have your list ready, why don't you let me know by messaging me through all the social media at An Immigrant's Life? I'd love to hear them. While we're waiting for your messages, how about let's talk about this week's episode. 30th of December is Jose Rizal's day. Rizal is the Philippines' national hero. After being executed by the Spaniards, he became an icon and inspired the Filipino revolution against Spain. I tell you this because this week's guest reminds me so much of Rizal. And as you will hear his story, you'll learn that he's also a hero in his own way. So, without further ado, let's get into the show. Isa, dalawa, tatlo. Today's guest is an artist, a historian, and a true Maginoo. Ah. The second coming of Jose Rizal. Everyone, please welcome Jacob Ira Azurin Vihandre. <laughs> Man, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I do want to correct something, though. I know people have called me historian and have kind of give me that, given me that label, but I prefer for them to... Uh, call me as a student of the history and culture. And the only reason is, one main reason is, um, I did not study history. Uh, I don't have a degree for, for history, but I get I get the, the, the respect that they're giving me. But I prefer to be called as a student because I don't want people to just take whatever I'm saying that is the fact or is the correct one. I want them to question actually what I'm saying. Uh, and research it just like I do. So appreciate that. Um, and it's interesting that you said the second coming of Jose Arizal. Is, is that, did you research that, Chris? Yeah, I do my research. <laughs> okay, okay, because yeah, because that was, uh, I would say during my prime with Bayani Art, that's what people were calling me. They were, they were, they were saying that I resembled Rizal and I was, I was, um, you know, I started to look like him um, and, and like the stuff and my behavior and my the way I, I conduct myself reminded them of what they had to sell. So they started saying that. And it, it's been a while since somebody said that. So I was surprised that he said it. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't read it anywhere. I just like, you know what? He looks like him. He acts like him. He's a polyglot like like him. Like, hell yeah, dude. I wish, I, wish, I wish I am. Uh, so far, I only speak two languages right now. But, you know, it's weird that you say that. And I appreciate you saying that because I've, I've ever since I researched Jose Rizal, I've always emulated myself. And I've always seen, this is on, this is just me, though. I don't, I don't, my standard, right? I've always kind of put Rizal as my standard as far as what uh, Indio Bravo or Filipino should be. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just kind of, to me, I think it's kind of like with martial arts, the, the, the pinnacle or, or the, the peak of, of martial artists, you know, most of the, most of the time people would say is Bruce Lee. Mm. Um, so they, they try to reach that, that level, if not go beyond that level. But with me, um, I think it was that was, um, was, was really the man that, that, you know, exhibited that. However, uh, now that I'm learning about uh, Paridel, Marcelo Del Pilar, mm-hmm. I might switch. I might switch. <laughs> here, hey, man. hey, you better not change, man. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. But no, thank you, thank you, man. Appreciate you uh, for the introduction. Uh, for sure, for sure. I mean, I when I wrote that introduction, I was like, yo, this is perfect for him. Like this is him, you know, at least for me, right? Yeah. And for, let me just get back to what you saying, like, oh, people is like, oh, you're saying like you're not a historian and people are like, oh, I don't want people to fuck those people, man. You are a historian. OK, 
you had your books, you do your research, you do it to the best of your ability and to you actually study it. What yeah. what's the difference between a historian and you? Yeah, what, no, you have the degree? You do, you do, you do have a point. Uh, you do have a point. I just want to make sure that I, I'm I I put that as a, as a disclaimer to to let people know that you know a pre and again uh, you know researcher actually would be better. But hey, you know what? We'll stick with the historian. <laughs> there you go. Fuck him, <laughs> man. So, but before we continue, if you wanted to promote anything, let me know. Let us the listeners know. Um. Yeah. I, sure. Okay. I'll take this moment. Um. So, I mean. You guys are more than welcome to 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 follow me um, on my my social media account. Uh, my Instagram is Jacob underscore Ira. I'm also venturing on the Kumo app. Um, they kind of got me to get on board to help promote the you know Philippine history and culture in the Kumo app and kind of help the northern part of America to get exposed with the app. So I'm, I'm helping them out on that. Um, one thing that I want to promote, um, since it's, 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 it's coming, I'm, I'm, I'm leading the project, but we'll, we're going to be Bayani Art, so our, a part of the group called Bayani Art. So Bayani Art will be um, selling some artifacts, uh, weapons of the Philippines, antiques, soon. Um, and the goal with that is, you know, when I started collecting weapons of our, our motherland, and I started really researching and, and knowing how it was used, who used them, and so forth. Um, and then came to find out that a lot of the a lot of the blades are are here in America and other places. Um, it's it's twofold because um, you know one is is being taken care of far more better than it's in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say anything bad in the Philippines. It's just Oftentimes in the Philippines, this artifacts is not really important to them. It becomes, you know, just like a tool. Um, so, you know, I just want to promote that. Hopefully before Christmas, we'll have the website updated and you'll see some, some weapons from, you know, from the, from the Southern Philippines. And hopefully we get some from the Northern part of the science also. But the goal is to be able to bring back the weapons to the Filipino community, right? So we have that audience. So my goal is to do that. Um, and I, not, not to say that we're not going to sell it to foreigners, but we want to have the Filipinos and, you know, the models for the Southern brethren of our people to have that first uh, chance to regain back the, 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 the weapons of, of our ancestors. So that's coming. So hopefully by, by before Christmas, uh, we'll have that posted. So save some of your money. <laughs> and spend it all on Christmas. All I right? told you when you were making that arnis, I'm like, yo, I want a piece of that, and you're like, you wanna, you wanna get one. I'm like, I have to talk to the wife. Yeah, no, I get it, I get it. But yeah, that, you know, I'll, I'll take that moment to just promote that. But I uh, appreciate you giving me that chance, man. And and you know, I, I, I you know, I love to promote your your channel, man. I think you're doing oh. something great. I think Thank you're doing you. something great, and the people that you get on or that you have on. Are, are are amazing, man. Again, this the stories that we are, are the stories that we have as, as immigrants. I think it's it's it needed. It needs an audience. It, it needs to be told. And you're doing it, man. You're you're facilitating it. Thank you. I appreciate that. I want to get back to what you just said there earlier about um, having the weapons. And you know, if it's in the the weapons are in the Philippines, usually they don't really like um, not prioritize, but like take care of it. Because I could say that in my, my personal uh, experience, my grandfather had an itak. Okay. Like a big, beautiful, uh, um, what, what is, is, it a, is it a sword? Itak is a sword? Uh, 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 what part of uh, the Philippines? Uh, Tagalog. Tagalog. So they would consider it bolo. Okay, yeah. yeah. So the bolo. Well, itak, itak and bolo are, you can differentiate depending on what region. But yeah, machete, right? Is yeah, some something like that. And it was a beautiful, it has the hilt, original hilt everything and when he passed on and he used to be a master carpenter my grandfather okay i mean he was really good but and then so he has like tools like old tools you know but the main thing that he had was that uh that bolo and when he passed away people came to the house and just start grabbing whatever they want to grab and that bolo 
got lost. Mm-hmm. And that lately I've been trying to track it, like who has it, when was the last time was it seen? I'm trying to get it back because I feel like, you know, like you, like trying to pay respect to our ancestors. And that's obviously more important to me because it's closer to me. I've seen it. I've held it. And, you know, I've seen him use it. Yeah, no, it's. Yeah, it's, you know, I've had I've had conversation with several tribes in the Philippines and you know when they found out that I, I you know um, I collect and research the weapons you know some of them reached out to me and they were selling their their, their family heirlooms man and it's, it's hard for me like part of me wants to get it but at the same time part of me doesn't want to because it's their family um, but again it's it's going to be sold to someone else if not me exactly uh, you know what I mean so yeah, it's it's, and I think there's uh, there's a there's an increase now of collectors and researchers in the Philippine in the Philippines that are actually doing the same thing that a lot of us are doing here in America. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'm only speaking about myself. I mean, there's others out there who are collectors. They just want to collect or are 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 buy and sellers, right? They they collect to buy and then they sell it. Uh, but to me, it, it definitely every piece that I, I pick, every piece that I, I own, I try to research as much as possible on what pieces are and the weapons are. And, you know, if I can track it down, that would be wonderful. If I can track it down, we used to own it. But, yeah, man, it's uh, I wish, man, I wish you the best. Hopefully you can uh, you can find your grandpa, your lolos at that. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, yeah, it's uh, it sucks, but um, hopefully I'll get it back. I'm 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 getting into the right track. I have spoken to people. Mm-hmm. The last time was uh, saw it, so hopefully we can track it back. But let's talk about Jacob's history. Okay. Where, where were you born? Which part of the Philippines were you born? Tell us. So, I was born in Olongapo City, uh, Sambales, in Luzon. So remember our, our address. Uh, lot six, block seven, Santarita Village, uh, in Alangapo City. So I was born there. Um, uh, my family, my mom's from uh, San Marcelino, uh, Ilocos. So she's Ilocano. My father's uh, from Tuktuk Leite. Uh, my grandma, Lola's what I tried. She's from what I. So, um, you know, I born and raised in the Philippines. Um, Stayed there for 14 years before we migrated in America, but but you know I was involved in Boy Scouts and stuff like that, so I was able to travel out. But mainly along the city, man, Batang Gapo, as they say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Have you read the book Gapo? Is there's a book Gapo? I don't know. Yeah, it's a novel by uh, Luwal Hati Bautista. Okay, and is it about Ulo ng Apo? No, it's about along Gapo. It's just Hello? it's just a life of people there. Oh wow. I'll, yeah, I'll see if I can find one because oh, it's, you know, it's easy to find because it's it's a normal like it's a very recent book, you know. Okay, yeah, definitely, man. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so yeah. I read that you almost died twice when you were born. <laughs> yeah, man. So I was supposed to be. I was born July sixth, um, but I was supposed to come out uh, from my mom. My mom told me that I was supposed to come out like the fifth. Right, the day before, uh, for whatever reason, um, I forgot what the actual thing was. But uh, you know, I, I was she bled and everything. I was ready, but I, I just I just won't come out. Um, you know, they talk about they, they. I think they were thinking about doing a cesarean, cesarean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, I, they they opted not to. So. You know, I came out naturally the 6th of July, uh, July 6th, the day after. But um, when I came out, I was like black, like like my whole body was like black. Mm. That's what she told me. And they had to, I guess I was eating like the bad stuff from yeah, her. Yeah. And or it was redirected to me um, in the wrong way. But they had to suck a lot of stuff out of me. Oh, man. Yeah. So so I was like, I was tiny and they had to suck a lot of stuff from out of me and um, you know, they said I almost died um, because I was there 24 hours, whatever was happening. If I hadn't come out, I would have just consumed whatever I was consuming and just died inside. Hmm. Um, so that was the first time that, that I almost 
did not make it after coming out. Um, the second time my father told me that uh, while I was recovering, while I was recovering, um, uh, a nurse was holding me and I slipped <laughs> and, and I almost, or I, yeah, or she, she wasn't holding me correctly, I guess. I don't know, but I slipped and my head was going to hit the floor, but she caught my leg like this. Bro. She caught my leg like that. You know, she, she was holding, she grabbed it with her right hand, I think. She caught my leg and I was dangling and she picked me up right away. Um, and my father just saw it in a glimpse. He looked and I was like, oh, shoot, um, that just almost happened. Um, so yeah, those were, those were the, the, the two times that I almost, That's you know. fucking crazy. Did your dad kick the nurse's ass? <laughs> I'm sure he would have if, if, if he was allowed to, but Holy shit, I, I don't man. know what I didn't ask. I didn't ask what happened to the nurse or anything like that. But mm -hmm. those are the two times that, you know, I almost just, you know, I just came out, man. Hey, I just came out. Why do you guys want to kill me already? <laughs> What's going on here? So how was your life in the Philippines? How were you growing up? Were you like? Let me just tell you, I was poor in the Philippines. Like, we're poor, poor. You know what I mean? How about you? Like, how was your life? So, man, it was, I always tell people that, you know, I would never trade my childhood in the Philippines. No matter what, man, no matter what. And I'm pretty sure you can, you can attest to it. Um, although, you know, obviously some people who actually live dirt poor would say otherwise. But to me, it was very adventurous. Um, you know, like I said, I told you, you know, I was involved in a lot of like camping and Boy Scouts. My mother was, uh, she, she was a, uh, she was a uh, district nurse in my elementary school. So a lot of people know her and, you know, growing up, man, it was fun. Um, you know, as far as like our status was, I would say we were like in the middle, low middle class, mm -hmm. um, only because I'm comparing it to people who are living in squatters, right? I would never consider myself poor uh, in compared to them. Um, so my father was working abroad. He was an aircraft mechanic. Um, he was never really around. Um, he was always abroad. I, my 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 memory of, of growing up with you know with him being around is very very vague. Um, and my mom was always working full time. Mm. Um, so you know I grew up pretty much with my brothers doing our own thing, right? I grew up with the real homeboys, right? The real homies that you actually grew up in, in home, at home. Mm. And I grew up in, in, in outside, I grew up in nature. So we had nannies and we had like uh, other people raising us as a kid. Um, but, you know, with, it was fun because, you know, I, I was able to experience a lot of things that people have experienced growing up in the Philippines. Like we, we, our playground was the outdoors. We go. We had a we had a field, a buke, right? Hell yeah. Yeah. So we would go there. We'd play softball there. We'd freaking chase the the water buffaloes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. Yeah, and we'd play in the mud where the water buffaloes are. It was crazy. Hmm. And you know, we would like we'd go uh, spider hunting in the buke. Right, yeah. it's the season, right? It's the season. We go over there and we'd we'd have our boomerangs and fly, uh, our, our frisbees and the bouquet. So not only that, where I grew up, we lived by the mountains. So we would go climb the mountains because our our nanny, our one of our lola, she's not my biological lola, but she uh, she she took care of us. She watched over us growing up, and she's uh, she's she was married to uh, Eta. Mm. Oh, right? sweet. Yeah. So. They live up in the mountains. So um, we would go there to visit sometimes. So she would bring us up there sometimes because, you know, she needed to do some work. So we go up there, me and my brothers. And then um, as, I, as I got used to the route of going there, I started bringing my friends. So we would go on weekends. We call it uh, fruit hunting. Mm. We go fruit hunting. <laughs> where we would go to people's like fields. Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> Freaking still the, 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 the bunga, the, the fruits, right? Yeah. Man, so we did that a few times, right? There's one experience where 
or with, so me and my homies would go boom, say, Hey man, I want some mango. Let's go get some mango. So instead of buying out of the market, we go to, to up to the mountain and, you know, bunch of trees, mango trees, but somebody owns the land. Mm. Right. Mm. So we would go. And then I guess they started knowing that these kids were stealing it. <laughs> so first time, I don't know if it was a person or they had a recording something, but we heard like a, a, a like a, a gorilla sound. They were trying to scare us. Mm. So I, you know, we're kids. I'm like, oh shit, what the fuck was that? Right. So, so we kind of got scared. And I said, all right, let's let's not come back to that place. But that, but then we came back. We came back and they let the hounds out. Oh boy. So they let the hounds out. I mean, boom, we ran, right? Because you know, in the Philippines, dogs were a lot of them have rabies. Mm-hmm. Right. So they let the hounds out and we ran out of that place. And they it, it chased us all the way to where like there's houses now. And man, when I tell you it was going downhill and one of my <laughs> homies just tripped and rolled. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, it, it was now thinking back, like that excitement, mm. it was part of our it was part of our growing up, man. It was just but yeah, so, you know, growing up, man, we did a lot of those. Um, I was, like I said, I was involved in Boy Scouts. Uh, my, my mom being a district nurse in the Philippines, um, she would involve me in a lot of a lot of activities. So I was involved in like, um, like cultural dances. Um, I did, I actually played Jose Rizal uh, in a play, which is weird, man. <laughs> I'll show you some photos. I have some photos of to get it from the Philippines. Hell yeah. So I, I played as Jose Rizal and we did uh well, what did we do? Um we did a play and we were reciting, I'm not sure it was it wasn't known in the El Elfili? El yeah, I think that's the one. Mm-hmm. Anyways, we were doing that and you know we competed. Actually we got up to the regional level. So we won the district, won the national, uh, won the, was it district first? And then it was the third level mm-hmm. where we competed everyone against everyone in the Philippines, right? So that's national. That's national, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's national. So we got third place on that one. And then, uh, you know, I was, my father would teach me martial arts here and there and my brothers. What kind? Mainly he was teaching me a Kikusin guy. Just like you, right? Mm. See, he was, uh, he was a fourth or fifth degree Kikusinkai karate. Um, and, you know, he competed a lot in Kumite matches in the Philippines, Singapore, and Saudi. Whoa. So he competed a lot. So he would bring me, out of all my brothers, he would bring me because I was I showed interest. Mm-hmm. So he would bring me to the competition. And most of the times I fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I wake up. I wake up like he's holding this big trophy, right? Or he has a medal on his, on his neck. Mm. Most of the times I would sleep, I would fall asleep. I don't know why. So yeah, so he, but he was, uh, he was trained in a lot of arts. So he did, he did judo, he did taekwondo, he did sikaran, um, and you know, a lot of arts. So he would teach me fractions of them. And then he actually wanted me to do it formally. So he put me um, in, in a Kikusinkai school, a dojo, and it was where he used to train. So I, you know, I, I I did that up. I got up to yellow belt, hmm. but it was this was during the nineties. It was different, man. That the the training that I did as a white belt in Kikusinka in the Philippines, it's like the black belt test that they have here today. No way! Oh yeah, I'm telling you, it was it was no no gears, right? When we full sparred, I, I now I'm not sure. I haven't asked my dad about this. Um, but you know, maybe that's another story that we can talk about. My, my parents got divorced. Mm. So, um, so maybe I, I was thinking now that maybe my, since my dad is known from that school that they thought maybe I can take it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so they made me spar with the assistant instructor who was a black belt and I was a yellow, it was my promotion to be a yellow belt. Mm. And I mean, when... When they said to fight or, or spar, this guy was not holding back. <laughs> you know, I was giving it to him, but 
dude was an adult compared yeah. to me. <laughs> In the 90s, man. And he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't holding back, man. Where to the point where I I was able to take advantage of his emotion. Mm. I, I I got him. I I connected a kick to him and he got pissed. And he he did a spinning back kick to me and I blocked it like this. Where I crossed my arm in front of me and I flew from the other <laughs> side. I went like a fucking anime. Yeah, I'm like boom. And I was like, I was. I was able to stay on the ground, so I was doing that like this. I was backing yeah. up, and then boom, I fell, and that's when they stopped. And that was the the end of my test. Did you get the belt? <laughs> yeah, I got the yellow belt. <laughs> awesome, it's worth it. By the way, that guy's an asshole. Yeah, no, you you know it's it, it, there's in martial arts, man. There's a lot of ego. Mm. Sure, I'm sure. So. You moved to California. Who moved first? How did you move? When did you move? Okay. All right. So, so my father was hired by Lockheed Martin um, in America um, in 2001. And, you know, it was, it, was, it was the chance for us to be all together, right? For my mom... And my dad and then my siblings would be all together, right? So, mm. um, so you know, everything was doing well. Everything was going great. Everyone, everything, you know, we're getting ready for our, we, we got our paperwork and stuff like that. And, you know, we try, we worked out what's, what we're going to keep, what we're going to sell because, you know, we're not going to be staying here and so on. So now me, I was 14 at that time. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to leave America. Uh, I didn't want to leave the Philippines because, you know, everything that I know for 14 years is in the Philippines. All right, you're gonna bring me back to a foreign country that I don't know about. Mm -hmm. Majority, all of my friends are back in the Philippines. Um, so I actually ran away. Bro, it was yeah. It was it was. I think it was a week before our 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 our, our flight. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's got so growing up, also, uh, I played a lot of uh, Counter-Strike and, and StarCraft mm -hmm. game, right, in, in, in computer. And I was in, in, I was in a team where we competed. Um, so, you know, I didn't want to leave all of that behind. So I ran away, man. I grabbed a backpack. I grabbed the money that I have. And I, I took a, a jeepney ride to the, to the city. <laughs> and I went to the cafeteria. The cafe, the internet cafe in front of our school where I would spend time uh, after after class. Mm. And I just, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to leave. So, you know, they found out I was missing. And then my father came looking for me and, you know, he figured out where I would be. So he found me in the internet cafe and, you know, I was playing. I was like, I'm not, I don't, don't want to go. And, you know, he was like, who are you going to stay with here? What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You're 14 years old. What are you going to do? It's like, I don't know. I'll figure it out. Blah, blah, blah. So to my surprise, he just stood there. Uh, he sat there with me and actually, instead of kind of like bombarded with more questions, kind of forcing me out, just, he just sat there and, and played. Hmm. He actually played with me. And we didn't talk about going to America. So we, we played in that, you know, as a kid, as 14 years old, I was like, okay, Oh, you know, I'm still going to play. I don't care what you do. And then, you know, after, after that, you know, I just, I, I just realized that, okay, uh, maybe I should go with them. <laughs> right. Um, and then um, just the day off, man, it was the day off our flight. And so we were getting ready. Boom. You know, I, I remember, I tried on the outfit that my father told us to, to wear. And he said, you know, you got to be presentable. It's going to be your first time in America. I'm going to you wear trousers and a white shirt, or even with tie, but, you know. It made it sound like somebody's waiting for you. Over, the whole America's waiting for you guys to come. No, exactly. That's what he made. He said, we got to look, look great, right? So, okay, you know, I was a kid. All right, so me and my brothers, we, you know, we're trying on you know, the black pants and then the white shirt. We're like missionaries, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so our flight was scheduled September 11, 2001. No. 
Yeah. What? And and I, I I can never forget this moment. So our flight was like in the afternoon, and I was sitting watching TV, and and all of a sudden my father came in. He rushed through the door, and was panicking. I've never seen him fluster mm. the way I saw him at that moment. He had long hair, so he was flustered. He was doing this with his hair. It was like it was like going crazy, right? So he was like panicking. I don't know what was going on. He was going walking back and forth, walking back and forth. He, he, he was, I remember him saying, oh, no, 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 no. I don't know if we're ever going to go back. We're going to be able to go to America. That was his, that was, that's what he was saying mm -hmm. repeatedly. And he was walking back and forth and walking forth. And then he looked, he finally looked at the TV and he said, turn that off, turn, turn the channel, turn the channel to the news. So he turned the channel to the news and all I saw was the tower smoking, right? Mm -hmm. And breaking news, boom, boom, 9-11 attack. So, so that happened. So did you get to leave that day or did you have to wait? No. So our flight got rescheduled two weeks after. Okay. And this is kind of like where the journey of my immigrant story started, right? Because so when I asked my, my family about it, I asked them, so what was, what was like the petition? What was the condition of the petition, right? So the petition was... Lockheed Martin was going to have, was going to, they had a contract with my father. It was going to be aircraft mechanic with Lockheed Martin. And um, he was going to work for them for five years. Within that five years, they're going to grant us our green card. Hmm. Right? So we got rescheduled, flew to America, I believe, on the 26th of September, 2001. Um, and you know, I, I, I didn't know the after effects. I didn't know the, the what you know what had transpired in America with the with the 9/11. Um, so we, you know, now mind you, even with all that with all of that going on, my understanding of what America is was from Baywatch. <laughs> <laughs> from, uh, was from the worst that? one. Um, and then Beverly Hills, obviously. Hell yeah, the, dude. Right? So that was my understanding of America, right? Mm. So, you know, I remember landing. It would land in LAX. Not in LAX. And my father was excited. I've never seen this guy happy. <laughs> finally made it. Mm. Right when we exit, he, why when we exit the plane, we exited the plane. He kissed the jet bridge floor, <laughs> right? He kissed the jet bridge floor. Boom. Was so happy. You know, I was a kid. I was like, this guy's crazy. Mm. Boom. So, and then we got, we got our bags and stuff like that. And then we exited the airport. He dropped his bag and did this. I'm in America and kissed the floor of that <laughs> where he was standing, right? So this guy was super happy and excited, mm -hmm. right? So a relative, a relative of us picked us up from San Diego in LAX and drove us to San Diego. Now, you know, it was a long flight. I was kind of falling asleep and it was at nighttime when we landed. Um, and here I am, here I was, man, expecting that we're gonna go in a mansion. Like, the place that we're gonna be staying at? Like it was a mansion, right? Because that's what I saw. Of course. <laughs> and another one, no, right? If you're yeah, America, exactly. everything is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, so boom. And man, when I tell you, when we drove in the driveway, I was like, where are we? What's the big house? It was a one bedroom house. Now, it was me. I have three siblings, so four of us, and then my mom. And my father so there's six of us and then my lolo and my lola living in a one bedroom house and we we're gonna stay with them oh my god so six so there's eight people in a one bedroom small house mm -hmm. so got there um i was like wow this is this it was a culture shock right i was like really this is where lola stays I thought, you know, maybe she's like rich with money, 
yeah. dollars and stuff like that because that was the mentality back then mm -hmm. still is yeah still is so the next morning i remember next morning we woke up in the living room we're like sardines sleeping and nobody told us this i don't know i think my parents knew so you know you was you were a kid you were adjusting to the new environment mm -hmm. obviously i met my my i met my my cousin at that time she was very small and my english was very bad and poor mm. um, very bad and poor and um, um so anyway so after that after that man um i think about a week or a couple weeks after my father was waiting for a call from mm. from the company and he finally got it and it wasn't it wasn't a good news oh boy um and my father told me is when he received the call from the company the company told him that because of the 9 11 attack or bombing um the company decided that they can no longer hire non-us citizen oh man now mind you we already sold our assets the only thing that we did not sell is our house um, so we sold everything and it wasn't enough because, you know, you have to have a show of money to the mm -hmm. government to say that you can take care of yourself. So we sold everything and we had to borrow money from our aunt in, 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 in the East Coast. So my, my father told me, um, you know, he had a talk with my mom and they had to decide. We either go back or we stay and figure things out. Um, Obviously, we stayed. You know, at that time, we didn't have, we, didn't, we, had, we had very little money to hire a lawyer to fix this. Mm -hmm. And for the lawyers that we consulted, it was always the same thing that they told us. You guys have a unique case. We've never had something like this where, you know, everything was going accordingly, but then boom, 9 11 happened and it affected everything. Mm -hmm. so so you know we you know my mom and my, my parents tried to keep what was going on away from us because we were already there so so yeah man so you know three years gone by and um we we couldn't fix it mm -hmm. so our, our visa expired and we became what a lot of people know as tnt mm-hmm Right, Tago and Tago. Yeah. Um, my father, he, you know, he worked two, three jobs because um, nobody wanted to hire him as a mechanic. Nobody. So he had to end up working like a Seven Eleven. Had to work at department stores. He had to, you know, he had to do like two, three jobs. Yeah, that must have been hard for your dad. You know, like being a smart guy, being a mechanic. Now suddenly he's a, you know in retail in 7-Eleven and whatnot. Did it, did it affect him? Obviously it affected him personally, but did he carry it on with the family or you mentioned that they were divorced. Was that a additional pressure? I would, I would say it was definitely a, a major contributing factor. Um, and, and so crazy, man. Um, so I might be jumping from timeline to timeline. Um, but you know, since you brought up the divorce, so I honestly believe my my father was already um, cheating on my mom when we were in the Philippines, hmm. um, only because of, of this one one story or one event that happened when I started noticing my, 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 my parents are not just not, they're not going out, they're not holding hands, they're not kissing, they're not hugging. Hmm. And I, I saw the, the tension going on. Um, oh, man. Uh, so um, besides martial art, I, I also ventured in um, dancing. So I was on a crump session, and I asked my father if I can borrow his video camera because I wanted to record the session. So I, um, I borrowed the camera. And we were recording, boom, boom, boom. We're at my place, at my friend's house. So I was recording, and then I was going to the playbacks because I wanted to review. 
Mm-hmm. I was going to a playback, man, and I saw a video that involved a father and another woman. Getting busy? Getting busy. Oh my god. This was this was this was at my friend's house during the session, and nobody saw it, but they knew something was wrong because I said, guys, I gotta go home. Oh man. I gotta go home. So so my father my, my my friend brought me back home. And at that time, my mom was working as a caregiver. Mm. Um, somebody took her in as a caregiver, obviously working under the table. Um, Filipino family, which we're forever grateful for, right? Because they gave, they provided us a home to stay. And, and so I, I went to the home care facility where we were staying at, and I just broke down, man. I sat with my mom in, in, uh, in the living room, and I just broke down. And she said, what's going on? And I, what's, what's going on? And now, prior to this, I, I, I already knew something was going on. I overheard my, my mom, and I was connecting the dots. I overheard my mom on the phone, and she was talking to my dad. And she said that, why don't you just go back to your son? He said, he said in, she said in Tagalog, Muy ganas anak mo sa labas. Yeah, she said, go home to your son outside. Yeah. Right. So when I first heard that, I was like, wow, that's kind of weird. So I was connecting the dots. So I sat down with my mom and I was crying and I, I told her, why don't you fucking leave this guy? And she said, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? And that was going on. Popped open the camera. Oh, my God. Showed it to her. I played it and, 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 and she watched, not the whole thing, but she watched some of it. And I was crying. She started crying. And she closed it very slowly. And, and she put her hand on my, sh- uh, on my shoulder. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. Okay, uh, and she said, I know now. I know what's been going on. Right? So... So I said, why, 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 why? Why did you let this happen? And, you know, I was just, you know, I was emotional. Why, you know, why, why, why? And, you know, she said, you know, your dad is the only one that can work. I can't just provide for us on my own. Hmm. Um, and, and after that, um, I just couldn't look at my dad. Mm-hmm. Just quit it. Um, and then I think the day after, I asked my mom about the conversation that I overheard. Um, and she said, Yeah, you have a half brother. This now my this is 2007, right? She said, You have you guys have a half brother in the Philippines, and he is seven years old. Mm. So he was born when we left the Philippines in 2001. This guy dropped a bomb and then left. Right? He had his own September 11, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, so yeah, so I mean, and, and at first I was like, God damn. Hmm. But I, I got mad at that moment when she said, his name is, my father's name is Ernesto. My mom said, his name is Ernesto Jr. Bro. Oh, man, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, let me give you a background. Hmm. I looked up, my father was my role model. Like I told you, he was in martial arts a lot. He hmm. was, um, not only that, he was an Eagle Scout, right? Part of me that went to Boy Scout is because of him. Not only that, he competed in sport. You remember Clara? No. Yeah, so Clara's like the Olympic in the Philippines in sports. So he was a, he was a gold medalist in swimming and and and, and bowling and table tennis and, and making bomb- babies and making babies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he was he was a champion, man. He was a gold medalist in all of that. Now, mind you, kid, 
if you have a father like that, dude, that's what's up, right? Yeah, hell yeah, dude. You're like, hey, I looked, up, I looked up to this guy, and it crushed me. Mm. It crushed me knowing that, you know, all of that, but he couldn't be a father and a good husband to my mom. Yeah. So yeah, man. So you know, did, sorry, sorry for cutting you up. But did yeah. this the one that uh, triggered the escape to Maryland? No, no, this wasn't it. Hmm. Um, what triggered the relocation to Maryland was, so like I told you, my mom was working at a home care facility, right? Hmm. So in a home care facility, uh, her coworkers were Filipinos as well. Um, now my mom being a district nurse, she was the top nurse, hmm. right? So her having that experience is the owner of the facility knows her skills and her experience. So she, they actually put her as a head caregiver. Now with that, jealousy arised with mm -hmm. the Filipinas, right? Because like, why is she a head nurse or a head caregiver? She doesn't have an LBN license, she has an RN license, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And there was one particular lady who was just going after my mom. And I guess she found out about the situation that we're at, our, our legal situation. Mm -hmm. And she started bullying my mom, right? Verbally, verbally, and, and just in work. She started bullying my mom. And uh, we had a talk, you know, I said, Ma, you gotta, you can't let these people walk all over you. Mm -hmm. um, and she said, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But, you know, she, she's very, she's very kind, she's very gentle. Um, but, you know, I was seeing this and to the point where, she started threatening my mom and us. Like, hey, you know, fuck you, blah, 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 blah. We're, I'm going to call, you know, DHS and Homeland Security and we're going to deport you, blah, blah, blah. So it came to the point where I think it went like that for a week. And then my mom finally cracked. She just cracked and she just went at her. Hmm. Dared her, go ahead. You know, like, do you want to do it this way? You want to go that way, that route? Go ahead. Here's the phone. Boom, 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 right? First time I see my mom mad, right? And I said, okay, this is going out of control. Now, at that time, I had already acquired a DACA, a work permit, right? So, so yeah, so at that time, I was driving already. So, you know, I felt, I felt like, hey, man, this can go. This, this can go bad for us if she actually did call not only is going to go bad for us going to go bad for the facility and the owner that that took care of us and took us in mm. i'll say I, I don't want that to happen so i talked to my mom I said mom it's best that we just get out of here mm. now mind you we, we barely didn't have any money and so she said where are we going to go and so I called my I called my aunt in, in, in Maryland. I said, aunt, which is my mom's younger sisters. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, uh, my parents are divorced already at this time. I said, this is what's going on. Um, you know, we're in this situation. I have to make a decision for the family, but we don't have a place to go. Mm -hmm. Would you be okay for you guys to to take us in? Um, because we don't know anybody else to go to. So my, my aunt at that time, luckily, fortunately enough, they had a basement that had two bedrooms that are vacant. Mm -hmm. So she said, okay, and now um, just, you know, come, come, bring, bring, bring everyone here. Um, let me know the date. Let me know, you know, when and so and so. Let me know if you need help. So, you know, I told my mom, hey, Aunt, Aunt Elsie said we can go and stay with there in Maryland and then, you know, let's let's go, let's get out of here because mm -hmm. this can go wrong. So so we left, man. We packed everything. At that time, like I was, you know, I was I was practicing to become a, a master penman. Mm -hmm. Because I was finding ways, right? The entire time my our lawyers that we consulted told us. There's only one way for your kids, or even you, to get your citizen is to get married to a citizen. 
Mm-hmm. That was the only way. Um, so at that time, I was finding ways to, 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 to get a citizenship, yeah. right? And I know, you know, there's a White House calligrapher, and I was going to actually, you know, apply for that, and, and, but then be able to showcase my skill set. And hopefully through that, you know, I, I'm, I can get a sponsorship mm. from, from the White House or whoever the company is. Um, so, so yeah, man, um, I had to pause that and I had to move my family from, from, from the West Coast to the East Coast, man. So, How was life in Maryland? Life, life in Maryland was pretty, you know, I tell people, man, they always say, you know, how's, how's life in Maryland? You know, what do you think about LA now? What do you think about so on? So I said, look, uh, I, 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 I look at it, you know, on an everyday basis, right? Uh, I can't complain. I can't, I can't expect because if I do, it's just going to disappoint me. So, uh, hmm. you know, I have, I have a place to stay. I'm going to make the best out of it. Right. Yeah, for sure. So in Maryland, um, it was, you know, it was the East coast. It was my first time being in the East coast and, you know, first time we experienced, no, it was fun, man. <laughs> it was fun. We were out, you know, my, 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 my aunt had a huge backyard. So we're out, me and my sister, man, it was first time. Mm-hmm. snow. we could, you know, we made our snowman and stuff like that mm-hmm. until I started driving in the snow and I said, screw this. I don't want to experience this again. But it- oh, trust me. I know. I'm from Montreal, man. No. So, you know, but living in Maryland, that's, you know, that's actually where I was, you know, I got the job at the airline industry. Look at this guy. He's like connected to airplanes all the time. I know. It's weird, man. It's weird because, and I'll tell you this, because, you know, oftentimes, you know, when you're a father and you're a father, right? So you know you want you want to be you want to you you want to give the best to your to your children right obviously mm. but oftentimes sometimes you want to you know you want your kids to follow your footsteps in a way right mm. but you know I was I was dodging that I didn't want to be compared with my dad because of what what he, what happened so but it's weird how the universe that's crazy but so what's your status now are you still daca or are you a citizen now what's your status now i'm still daca so i'm i've been i've been re, i've been renewing my 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 uh my daca and my work permit uh, every two years um and you know i don't know if you're familiar with that but the condition of that is you have to be a good citizen you can't have any um felony or misdemeanor i think even misdemeanor or, or, or low 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 offense that's crazy you can't have it because once you reapply and that's on your record, they'll reject you right away. Mm-hmm. I can't go back to the Philippines. I can't travel out of America. Um, I can exiting, but I can't come back. <laughs> um, what about California over here? Um, what, uh, Montreal? No, I mean, like you, like you, you can stay, but you can't leave. Yeah, I mean, I can go stay from states and I can mm-hmm. go to like territories. So, sorry for cutting off. How did you end up back in uh, California? So, Okay, back. So Maryland, I was there for uh, the. I lived in uh, Virginia also um, when I was in the DMV, which is the DC, Maryland, Virginia area in the East Coast. Mm. So I think I forget what year, but not too long ago, when my mom, when my mom and I. So prior to us leaving California, when that whole incident happened, when my parents divorced. My mom, I forgot what you call it, but my mom started had, she, she began having an emotional breakdown mm. or she became, um, what's that word? Where you start seeing things. Hallucinating. Cisco, Cisco, what was it? Schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, yeah. So she started having that condition where, man, so now seeing my mom broken apart, it's fucking hard, man. Um, so that carried over when I went to, uh, to the East coast, Mm -hmm. I think part of it is she felt like I I really didn't ask her this. She felt like she was a failure to her children Mm -hmm. and, you know, living, living at my aunt's place, which is her younger sister. She was the oldest and then her sisters are like successful and have these big houses Hmm. Um, I felt like she felt like she was a disappointment 
back to her kids. And, and so she would lock herself in the, in the room and she wouldn't come out. And to the point where um, my aunt and my uncles and her sat down and said, I think it's best that you go back home in the Philippines. Um, when, when that sit down happened, um, you know, I talked to my mom after that conversation. I said, Ma, so, you know, it's, it will, she asked me, you know, I said, it will be easier for me and Dave to kind of do our own thing if we want to, not, not having to worry about you and Rose. So my sister, our old, our youngest, Rose Lee, she has a condition. She has Down syndrome and autism. Okay. So we can't just leave her alone. So we decided that it's best that my sister also go back with my mom, with my mom. Yeah. And, but she know, had schizophrenia, like you said, like, but no, but it wasn't, she wasn't, she wasn't diagnosed, but she was, she was showing the symptoms. Oh, okay. So she's just showing symptoms, but she wasn't really diagnosed. So, but when she went back to the Philippines, she was okay. After that six months, she recovered and she was able to kind of like function, you know, normally without the whole hallucination and mm -hmm. people listening and stuff like that. Yeah. So she, you know, she was back to normal. That's right? good. And then was, that's when you, when she left for the Philippines, that's when you moved to California? No, not, not right away. Okay. So when she left, when she left to the Philippines, after that, you know, after that, man, um, we're still living at my, 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 uh, my aunt's place. And my, my uncle, he was a retired, retired Navy. Um, he served in the Navy, retired. And now he, he works for the DOD. And he has a, a, a clearance, a high clearance with the government. Um, so his clearance was scheduled to be renewed. And we couldn't be there. We couldn't be in a household where a guy with a government clearance and, you know, with our status, we couldn't be there oh, because no. there, were, there were inspectors that going to come. You know, for you to renew your clearance, there's some inspectors going to come. They're going to ask questions, blah, blah, blah. Make sure that you're still, you know, good to receive the clearance, which is a top secret clearance. Mm -hmm. So we had to, my, my uncle told us that, you know, Sorry, guys, but uh, you guys have to be somewhere else with this, with the length of the, the, the renewal of my clearance in order for me to continue my job. Hmm. So, um, so what, what brought me back to California is all of this was happening. I was concerned about, you know, we were sending money to my mom, concer still concerned about me, um, figuring things out, how I'm going to get, you know, a green card, a citizenship. Um, so I was still exploring that and whatnot. And at the same time, you know, I was, I was figuring out what I want to do in, in my life, right? Meaning, you know, maybe start a family or, you know, pursue my passion. Um, so at that time, I was pursuing my martial art passion at that time. So um, when I was in in the East Coast, I, I had encountered a teacher who I'm training with now in California. And I flew out to visit him and to check out his school and to meet him. And I was like, man, I've never, I've had many teachers in martial arts. I've been doing martial arts more than 20, uh, more than 20 years. Yeah, more than two decades now. I've had many, many teachers. I've never had a teacher like this guy. His name is Mark Makita. Um, and the moment I met him and the moment, you know, his philosophy and his way of teaching and his way of, of living is aligning to, to me, I said, man, I got I to gotta learn from this guy. Hmm. He's 61 years old now, but he looks like he's freaking 30. I mean, this guy is, is phenomenal, man. So I talked to my brother. I said, hey, man, thinking about moving to California, I mean, we can move together, but it's going to be tough because it's expensive as hell here, right? It's going to be tough, man. It's not going to be easy. Um, and uh, it's not guaranteed that we're going to find you a job. To mm. So, you know, 
I, I had to take a, I had to take a chance. I, ha I have this opportunity to go back to California and fully train with my, with my teacher, um, knowing that, you know, it's going to be hard with the salary that I'm earning. And I said, you know what? Screw it. I, I don't know if I'm ever going to have this opportunity again, especially with the pandemic. I'm just going to go for it. I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. I'm California, I'll figure it out. Uh, I'll work something out. So I did. I told my brother, hey, if you're going to stay, you can stay here um, with the current place that we're renting in Virginia. And which is, you know, it was just, you know, throughout the journey of this, my life, man, for whatever reason, you can call it garden angel or you can call it the ancestors, whatever. It's always been the Chabba Bryans were, were always there to help us out, man. And um, so that, that pretty much what drove me to California back is, you know, my, my passion in martial art, my pursuit in martial art, especially in Eskrima, Filipino martial art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk to you. I want to talk to you more about this uh, Eskrima and your art. And sure, sure. Why, I, you know, like, and why is it important for you to collect Filipino arts and artifacts? So I, re I didn't really go out with that mindset. Like, you know, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to collect all of this stuff because it's important to me. It, to me, when, when I joined Bayani Art in 2011, that's when everything opened up with, you know, with Philippine history. Because prior to that, I was, I was, I was, had a, I had a crab mentality, man. Hmm. You know, as a kid, we're bullying like darker skinned children because if we didn't know any better, we're ignorant. And my, 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 my knowledge in Philippine history was very, very small and very little, right? So with, with, my, with, my, with that, with my exposure and my, my, my um, involvement with Bayani art, right? Um, and, and being able to know the history and, and learn about the people and our, our, our homeland and people that lived before us and what they went through, what they had to go through in order for us to be the Philippine government or the Philippine nation that we are today. I was fascinated by it. Hmm. So this, this people, you know, they were, they were fighting to live, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, as far as Filipiniana and, you know, books and, and the artifacts, um, I, I'll say it this way. Um, one, the martial aspect of it, martial being military war. Um, you know, I wanted to be able to be, I wanted to feel and be close to the source of the art that I'm practicing. Mm -hmm. And for, for me to do that, I need to be able to hold the weapons that they use in order to understand the movements that I'm doing. Sure, you can use that with training blades, stuff like that, but I mean, what's compared to the real one, <laughs> right? So I started, I started collecting, you know, weapons of, 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 of the models and weapons of the Luzon area and the Visayans. And, you know, I started, it, it started making more sense to me on, you know, why they use the weapon based obviously based with that parallel to that i was also researching the people that used it and and it's, i'm still doing it i'm not done it's, there's still a lot of things that's happening which is actually one of like I'm, I'm looking around right now in my place you know i've brought people here and i'm seeing their reaction and i'm seeing the spark that happens in their eyes in their and they tell me, you know, having tangible, having something three-dimensional, mm. when I teach, say, this is why we're doing this movement, because it came from this. Mm. And them seeing it and understanding it by that point of view, it, it just it brings that light in their eyes. You know, it's been a blessing to witness that. And even just bringing them in in my place, and they're like, they're walking in like, oh, shit, this is like a museum. I said, yeah, I kind of carried it that way because I want to be able to, you know, one, obviously, I, I feel like I'm surrounded by my ancestors, right? Second, um, again, when I'm teaching, I try 
to teach the history part as well. Um, and, and, you know, there's, I think there's, uh, there's a change right now that's happening. I mean, in, in Northern America, I'm not sure if in Canada as well, where a lot of Canadian uh, Filipinos or American Filipinos or Philam, um, you know, feels the need of that identity or that they want to know more about their culture. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to do it? The closest way to do it, obviously, is to go back home, mm. spend time with the people there. But if you can't do that at the moment, then, you know, to me, reading the books, collecting the Filipiniana books and reading it, cross-reference it, and then, you know, having the weapons. And actually, when I practice the movement and I hold the weapons and use it, it, it gives you a further, deeper understanding of the, the movements and the techniques that was created back then that are still being used today. Where do you buy the weapons? So there's auctions, online auctions. There's um, like uh, collector armory shops. Mm. There's collectors that sells it, you know, word of mouth people. Uh, but my majority of my weapons, um, there's eBay too also and Etsy. You'd be surprised that Etsy would sell them, mm -hmm. you know, from, you know, before I met a lot of the collectors that I know now, I would hunt on eBay. Oh, okay. I'll do like a lot of, how do you know if it's authentic? So, it, it, you know, it takes time. It takes time for you to learn it where once you see it, you spot, okay, that's, that's an old blade. You know, that's like an antique blade hmm. um, compared to like you'll, the, 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 the tourist ones or the ones that are are new, you, it's easily, first thing that you can tell if it's a modern made, it's the, just the type of the blade, I mean, the metal that they use for the blade. Okay. You can just see, oh, this is, this, is, this is new. And then obviously the, the hilt, the type of metal that they use and the, the shape of the pommel is just, one way to do it is once you earn or study the antiques, then you can easily differentiate what's not antique and what's not. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that's like your question on what's real or not, but no, that's uh, good. That, but um, I I like antiques. Well, I like watching like uh, antique roadshow, and mm -hmm. that's what pretty much what they do is like, oh well, uh, this is this sort is uh, antique because there's this uh, this design and this material and all that stuff. Like pretty much what you just said, right? Yeah, yeah. Because you gotta think about it too. With um, even with like dating the years of the blade you know you look at the material that there was used so if it's like alloy or like it looked like a, a low class metal hmm. that can be dated like world war ii because at that time whatever they can find they would use mm -hmm. later we you know later like maybe you know up until 18 you know, up until 1900s you know they were using like real good metals because we had those with trades and you know, you know, with 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 the metal like silver and copper and nickel stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one way to do it. And obviously, like you know, the shape of the blade and the, the patina and the age of, uh, of of the the pommel. But nowadays, man, this is how great Filipinos are. But a lot of the modern blades, they 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 sell it to look old. <laughs> oh yeah, I've seen this. I've seen this in news, and they're like, especially in Batangas, they're really good over there. Yeah, yeah, they would they would make it look old. They rub sand and make it look old, and they're good at it. So mm, that's that. awesome. You keep on saying about Bayani art. You want to talk about Bayani art, like what it is and what's the idea of it? Yeah, so Bayani art started in 2010. Um, it was founded by uh, a guy named Joseph Akilasan. He's known is he's, he's known as Joe. I call him Queer Joe because he became my mentor in um, in Philippine history. So Bayani Art started as a, as, a, as a platform for him to share the history, the Philippine history and the culture through arts and apparel, right? Mm. So in the beginning, it was just a, it was an apparel company. And there, was, there were a lot of apparel companies at that time, 2010. A lot of them, majority of them doesn't last. Majority of them are, are, are no longer there. But for us we found a way to able to stay afloat, right? And mm. to continue. So 
Bayani art, the name Bayani. Um, uh, so we cho he chose Bayani, um, which represents, you know, hero, warrior, um, because he was a martial artist himself. That's one part of it. And, you know, we wanted to promote our heroes in our apparel. You know, that's the art come. Art comes from our expression of, of things. So Bayani art, right? Uh, so, you know, the main, again, the main focus of us, of, of us, uh, or, or, of him prior to me coming in a year after was to help promote the history of the Philippines in, in America. And obviously we, we, people know us now in the Philippines to, to do that exactly, you know, to have an apparel that you can be proud of that was made by Filipinos, created by Filipinos, and that's for the Filipinos and now Filipinos, obviously, also. We have a lot of non Filipinos now that are a big fan of us. But, but yeah, that's, you know, that was, that was, we did that for like a decade. And now we're, you know, as you can see, we are now switching to books. We're, we're, we're now switching our gear to books because you can only do apparels as long as you can. But now we want to switch to books because now we have created an inspiration through our apparel, which is great. Um, but now we really want to target the kids, the next generation. That's mm -hmm. why we're doing the children book is for them to get inspired at a very young age. Um, along with that, um, you know, I'm starting, the, when I did the promotion earlier, I'm starting to, we're going to start selling um, artifacts and antiques. Um, on our website. So we're finalizing the, the session where you can click on that. Um, and again, that's, that goes back to, you know, it's, it's best for, for these artifacts to be at, at, you know, Filipino home. And those, you know, obviously there's a caveat to that, but those that really care and really want to know, man, you know, I think a lot of these artifacts that we have, it, it needs to go back home and needs to, I mean, the, 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 the Field Museum in Chicago, man, they have about over a thousand of artifacts. Yeah, the, I read about this. The, the, it's like a golden statue, a small statue that was yeah, taken that's, away. That's in, that's in Chicago, yeah. Yeah. In the vault, we were, we, were, we were fortunate enough to visit the vault of the Field Museum. And I'll show you some photos. And we, we too, I'm talking about racks and, and just like boom, aisles and aisles of Philippine weapons, artifacts. I saw a wooden dildo. <laughs> you know, we're, 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 our ancestors were freaky back then, man. Um, oh, yeah. And, you know, a bunch of stuff there that's, I mean, look, there's two folds, right? Because they're being, they're in great, great mint condition because they're being taken care of. Mm -hmm. This was sent back home, man. Majority of the times, this is gonna, probably going to be it's going to be sold. Yeah. It's That's going it. to get stolen. Yeah. No one's going to take care of it. Unfortunately, I agree with you. Like, obviously, it should be displayed. Right. Right. And it should be uh, shown to the pe the public. But uh, like I, like you said, like if they we bring this home, it, it won't be good. It's gone. I mean, you see it now. The, the Leon Gallery. They've been selling a lot of the documents of the Katipunan, man, to collectors. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it. I guess the family wants it to be sold, but, man, it's, it, 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 it's they should belong to the museum, man, preserve for people yeah. to be able to visit and look at. I completely, completely agree. Like, just, I mean, obviously, some of them are poor, right? And struggling, that's why they're selling it, which is fine. But the problem is, like, once they sell it to uh, collectors, they just hide it and they don't show it to nobody. It's private, yeah, it becomes private. Yeah, and which is like, come on, man, like, it's still yours, you know, like, you can still put your name, like, oh, by the way, uh, let's say Jacob, Jacob donated this. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Sorry? No, no, no. That, that's kind of like the synopsis of Bayani. All right, we're kind of moving on to. You know, I'm working on, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start working on a book also with, with Bayani Art because that's where we're leaning towards to is just now we're going to go making books 
and you know obviously the artifacts and stuff like that we're venturing in a new a new a new realm hmm. uh, but i want i want to create a book me, me and create joe we're, we're planning on creating a book a coffee table book where it's just gonna kind of combination of stuff that me and him have done and you know my photography my martial arts and the bye bye in put them all together where people once they open it, it's like man Ooh, I want to get a copy of this. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I would love to see that. But anyways, yeah. I think we're there, buddy. Before we end it, do you have any last remarks or anything you want to add? Oh, no. Just, you know, thank you for 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 giving your time, man, for, for allowing me to share my story. Um, I know I kind of went in a lengthy um, go on things. I mean, I, I'd love to do this again if, if you're... If you have more questions that maybe you haven't asked, like with martial arts and other things, um, but no, just just thank you for your time, man. I appreciate you. I appreciate what you're doing, and you know, keep keep doing it, man. Keep thank keep, you. Yeah, thank you. The stories that you you gather it, it, it inspires a lot of people. It inspired me. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good day. Hey, thank you, man. Appreciate you, brother. Again, Jacob, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, listeners, for listening. And I wish you enjoy the rest of your holidays. And I'll see you guys later.